Well, I want to welcome everybody tonight uh, to the 16th year of the East Hampton Library's Authors' Night. And despite the pandemic, we're carrying on and um, we're so glad to have you here with us. I'm Sarah Davison. I'm the president of the East Hampton Library. And I'm just thrilled tonight to be part of our lecture with two very distinguished scholars and writers who are going to um, mesmerize us with a fascinating history of a place we all know and love, Grand Central Station, and the incredible people who worked there and populated it and helped everyone get from point A to point B. We have um, Alelia Bundles, who will be doing the interviews, and Eric K. Washington, the author of this incredible book. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Alelia Bundles, um, to take it away. Thank you, Alelia. Hi, Sarah. It is just a pleasure to be here with you this evening and to be able to talk with my good friend, Eric K. Washington. Eric is a New York City-based independent historian and author. He is the owner of Tagging the Past, which endeavors to reconnect forgotten history to present landscapes through articles, talks, and tours particularly in unsung areas of Upper Manhattan. His interpretive signage in West Harlem Pierce Park, which won the Municipal Arts Society's Masterworks Award, celebrates the waterfront location of his first book, Manhattanville, Old Heart of West Harlem. Eric's current book, which we will discuss tonight, is Boss of the Grips the life of James H. Williams and the Red Caps of Grand Central Terminal. It grew out of research fellowships at Columbia University's Colum Community Scholars Program, CUNY's Leon Levy Center for Biography, and a residency at the Brown Foundation's Dora Maar House. Eric reintroduces a once influential labor figure who lived between 1878 and 1948, and the singular Harlem-based Black workforce he headed at America's most august railroad station, whose individuals often infused the lifeblood of the new Negro movement and the storied Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s. I'm happy to say that Eric's book recently was awarded the New York Academy of History's Lehman Prize, and Eric is a director of Bio International. So Eric, Wonderful to see you. I you wish we could be with each other in person, but I know that you have great stories. So why don't we just start with who was James Williams? Great place to start. Well, James H. Williams uh, was a native New Yorker. Uh, he was um, notably for the purposes of my book, which made me explore him, uh, the chief of the Red Caps. These were the crew um, I don't know how old the crowd is here, but uh, maybe from old movies, you know, there were uh, often when you were riding, the, going for a train ride, there were uh, men who would come to help you with your bags from your taxi or um, from the trolley or from the bus or whatever, direct you to the, the train. Uh, by and large, they were African American. So he did this, he was the chief of, he was the very first black red cap. Uh, he started at Grand Central in 1903. And for almost half a century until his death in, in 1948, um, he led this crew, which was influenced um, this system, this red cat system in railroad stations across the country. Uh, he was particularly noted for having hired, uh, not exclusively, but um, particularly uh, young African-American uh, college students who were studying all disciplines uh, in towns, particularly in HCBUs from the South, also in Ivy League schools from the Northeast and around the, the New York City area. So often this was the first time that a lot of these black students from different areas of the country were meeting each other. And uh, anyone who's had to have a second job uh, to help defray their school costs knows how important that is to be able to find something. And uh, this was a particular a bent of his to make sure that uh, these guys were able to finish their schooling without any encumbrances and uh, have a job to be able to do that. So that's kind of the, the, in a nutshell, who he was. 
Right. And we and we will dig more deeply into who some of those individuals were as we as we go along. But you know, one of the things I think everybody who's watching, I'm sure, has been inside Grand Central Terminal. And in some ways, um, the building itself is as much a character uh, as James H. Williams. So talk to me about what we should know about Grand Central Terminal. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned in your introduction, I, I, I tend to like to show people things that are off the beaten path. And Grand Central Terminal doesn't really qualify as off the beaten path. But I think it's um, one of the things that's fascinating or fascinated me when I started to learn about Williams was that you start to see the, this particular railroad station, this famous place in a way that you haven't seen it before. And if you can imagine uh, another time, uh, one of the things that it pro Grand Central prided itself on was its Swiss watch-like precision in terms of the trains running on schedule. Uh, even while they were building the station, uh, the, the, the terminal that we know and love today, uh, on top of the Grand Central Station on the same footprint uh, that it existed before, but the trains were still running on time. So imagining that and what was integral to the station functioning was this literal manpower. Uh, these men who were able to get passengers to and from their trains uh, to their destinations, but also to be uh, sort of walking encyclopedias of what was relevant to, to the city. So you can imagine getting out of a, a, a coming in on, on the station and, and the first thing you need to do is get directions to get your bearings. So you would go to a red cap and they had, they were distinctive by two uniforms. One was the red cap that they wore on their heads, but also by race uh, because they were, they were all black. And so in that regard, they were immediately distinguishable. But in another regard, because of this uniform, particularly the hat, they more than anybody else had this immediate sense of authority. This was somebody you knew you could ask a question of. And um, they would be able to tell you not just, you know, where to get your nearest trolley line or the subway, um, but also questions like, where can I, where can I eat? Or how do I get to the polo grounds? Uh, this was before Yankee Stadium was built. Um, what uh, is the best way to get to Broadway? Can I walk to a show? You know, that sort of thing. So they had a sort of an all around, um, uh, function, uh, not just for the railroad station, but having to do with hospitality and uh, the, you know, the, the transportation industry as, as, as a whole. So, you know, what you're talking about here is them connecting and he, he was connecting people, both some of these amazing people who later became very famous, who were young college students as well as some famous New Yorkers. Now, I don't know if it's easy for us to go to the individual slides or if we just want to talk about that and go to that later, but tell me about some of the people who worked for him, who he hired and who later became bold-faced names. Well, some, <clears throat> one person was in, in particular, I'll start with him because he was uh, Chief Williams's assistant chief, Red Cap. And uh, in 1909, he started studying for the police force, which uh, had no African-Americans on the force. And in two years later, in 1911, he would become New York City's first black uh, policeman. So uh, this was uh, Sam Battle or Jesse Battle as he was known to, to, to friends. And um, he, let me see, I think I may have a, an image of him. Can you see this on your screen or do I have to do something nifty? Are you looking? Share screen. Share screen, okay. I've got to get up on the technology here. <laughs> All of us. <laughs> yeah. so, um, um, was one of the first celebrities. But you had people like uh, Paul Robeson, the, uh, the singer, the actor, the activist um, in the early 1920s. Um, I mentioned all disciplines. Um, uh, John Lewis um, uh, 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 Wilson who was an architect, and uh, he would build the Harlem River Houses, which were the first uh, federally funded housing project in, in, in the city, I think perhaps even in the country. Uh, and his, whose daughter became a federal judge. Exactly, I think she's still practicing. Um, uh, you had um, Richard Huey, who was uh, one of the workingest black actors on Broadway. He was in Porgy before it became a musical Porgy and Bess. 
He was in the Pulitzer Prize winning uh, play, Abraham's Bo Bosom. He got that show while he was red capping. And he was uh, stopping the show every night in the 1940s um, in Bloomer Girl with Celeste Holm and Dooley Wilson, who was, uh, Dooley Wilson wasn't a red capper. We may know Dooley Wilson because of uh, uh, Casablanca. Uh, he was Sam, uh, the piano player. Um, so you had people in all different disciplines. You had the clerics, uh, Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Some worked just for, you know, holiday, a week or two, some throughout the summer. Some got their degrees and kept the job as a moonlight job. Um, so they were uh, often maybe, you know, doctor by day, red cap by night. Uh, certainly during the, as the, the financial um, reversals that, that came with the, the Great Depression in the 1930s, you couldn't have too many jobs. So uh, some people would do this, whatever they had gotten their, their degrees to practice, but also continue to carry bags as red caps, uh, you know, on, an, on, on, this, on another schedule. So this was, this was one of the things that made red caps unique out of any other workforce in the city. These men were uh, conspicuously overqualified for these jobs, these were menial jobs, and it wasn't unusual to see headlines in, in magazines uh, like PhD carries your bags. Uh, the New Yorker magazine would write about this, um, uh, various newspapers. So these were sort of human interest stories that, uh, that pointed up sort of the injustice of the system uh, it was our, our version of Jim Crow in the North and in the greatest city in the world in New York City that wasn't um, really outside, so, so far afield from these sort of racial, racial uh, separations that we associated very strongly with the South, but they happened all over the country. And perhaps because Grand Central was so, um, so grand, so large, so uh, complex, uh, it made it that much more interesting to see that it was not immune from these kinds of social conditions. So, so Eric, that's one of the things that, you know, it's like this invisible um, black life that was going on, the hidden in plain sight. And, you know, right now we're re-examining how we learn history in America, usually pretty poorly, like people of color generally left out of the story. Mm -hmm. But I think part of what you're talking about here is all of these people who were right under other people's noses and this sort of parallel world um, that he was um, operating in. So talk a little bit about what that means, that parallel world that was going on uh, for James H. Williams and the people who were working with him. Yeah, so he was also part of, he was, he was Harlem based as were most of the men who worked there. And um, this particular job, because jobs were so few and far between uh, for, for black men and they were so necessary, this became sort of an ideal place to organize. Um, and because it was sort of grunt work, uh, you had to sort of sustain the morale of, 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 of these men. And sometimes he was, he was supervising upwards of uh, 500 men at a, at a time. So he was noted particularly in Harlem for that because he was a supervisor, he was a black supervisor of these literally hundreds of men. Um, and because this position was so valued, a lot of um, organization heads like um, James Weldon Johnson when he headed the NAACP and Walter White who was his successor, um, would rely on Williams to help uh, generate fundraising uh, for their activities, to disseminate information, um, when they were doing particular actions. Uh, we're celebrating, uh, I think it's this month, it's the 103rd anniversary of the famous silent protest parade, uh, where there were 10,000 uh, black men, women, and children protesting the uh, East St. Louis massacre, where about 100 uh, African Americans were, were, were slaughtered and, and brought daylight over labor issues. Um, and the action that was led by the NAACP was to have people march down the street, you know, if you, but it was silent, which was in, in the name. So you can imagine the impact of this kind of action with all of these people marching. Um, but you would have people on the sidelines, obviously not knowing what's going on and why aren't they speaking? You know, they had big banners rather than shouting slogans. And the red caps, um, it was, Williams had the 
the authority to say, don't work in the station, go out to the corner as the march is coming down past 42nd Street and give people information. So we could set up sort of a, uh, a speaker's bureau, if you will, that would help to represent the NAACP. He created organizations within the Red Cap workforce uh, to help sustain morale, uh, an orchestra, a, um, a quartet. This was not just to serve entertainment purposes, which of course they were, they even recorded um, a few records, but it made the men autonomous so they could go out and actually um, be hired out as orchestras for, for weddings or for the opening of a golf course in, in Westchester, um, for uh, fundraising for the fire department in Rhinebeck, uh, New York to, to, to get money for a fire engine or individually as, as musicians. Um, a baseball team, I may, I know I do have, uh, this is, I'm going to stop right there. This was his son who was New York's, who was Manhattan's first black fire officer in 1919, Wesley Williams, uh, who was standing in the group photo on the extreme right. And uh, the inset on the left is, uh, you could see that he's, his physique was not just uh, a hobby, but it was also political. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in 1918, when he took the test, there were 1,700 applicants for the test. Wesley was the only black applicant. He was the only one out of 1,700 who scored 100% on the physical examination. Uh, and you just have to look at him and, and not wonder why. Um, but it was political, his physique, in the sense that he knew because he was the only one, he would remain the only uh, black on the force for, for many years. Uh, his first day on the job, everyone asked for a transfer. The captain of the um, firehouse, uh, this was on Broom Street where he had most of his career, still an active firehouse, resigned as soon as he showed up for work. And um, it, it allowed him, because he was being ostracized by the rest of the crew, he, he would say in an, his own oral history, when they went upstairs, when he went upstairs, they went downstairs. Uh, it allowed him to take over the roof of the firehouse and build a gymnasium and work up. And he knew he would be contested and, and, and he was, and he'd have to literally fight for his life. So um, he would do, he was an all around athlete like his contemporary Paul Ropes and they knew each other. Um, but it wasn't just athletics for the fun of the sport. It was that for him as well, but it was also uh, in order to protect himself. And also as an educator, because he would do exhibition bouts and things to encourage and inspire young men in, in Harlem at the Harlem YMCA on how to keep physically fit. He was an early um, follower of uh, the man, Bernard McFadden, who was considered the father of, of uh, physical culture, uh, a teetotaler and kind of fascinating. And it was quite logical that Williams's son, because of Williams's position, when they were looking to shoe in a black candidate to be on the fire department, that they would look to Wesley because in his teenage years, he had kind of made his reputation. So what, so Chief Williams, his father, had that kind of position of knowing uh, what people's capabilities were, what their particular talents were, and making those introductions, both from um, black organization holders and, and uh, officers and uh, uh, directors in Harlem, but also in the world of white businessmen and, and men of influence like Teddy Roosevelt, um, uh, Charles Thorley, who was the preeminent uh, florist of the Gilded Age, uh, the Vanderbilt family, which was uh, behind Grand Central uh, in, in the first place. And he cultivated these relationships um, and as he moved along was able to rely upon them. Uh, he wasn't just uh, in the position, you know, there's this, an expression, having more friends than a head waiter, which kind of suggests that they're not really friends at all. In some instances, that might have been the sense, but a lot of people knew him and they knew, they relied on him. They knew he was, um, they knew his character and they, he was their liaison to speaking to somebody of, that they wouldn't generally have access to, uh, direct access to from their social circle. So if Teddy Roosevelt, where Eleanor Roosevelt um, wanted to get a, you know, keyed into what was going on in labor, things that she spoke about, uh, particularly when the Red Caps were, were organizing. Um, Williams might have, was, was somebody who could be, be tapped. You know? And these were people who all, like everybody else, high and low, 
if they had to get from one place to another, they rode the rails. So he was in this perfect position to, to negotiate these, these relationships. So Eric, and you, what you're talking about with um, chief, the chief's son, mm -hmm. uh, he and his son and many of the people who worked with him were the first, the, the first black person to do this, the first, the first, the first. But it, he also, as you are mentioning here with the Vanderbilts, with the Roosevelts, uh, he leveraged those relationships, not just within um, the black community, but also with some powerful white bold face names. So you, you mentioned the Roosevelts. Talk a little bit about some of the things that he was able to um, help make changes with. Well, I'll tell you one instance. Um, are you looking at the screen? And I just, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm having... so we see Wesley. <laughs> so uh, this is a letter that he wrote, and this involved Wesley. So Wesley joined the, uh, the uh, fire department in um, 1919. And um, he's the only black in the fire department for years. And then by 1927, he is up for a promotion. And he's done heroic acts that the papers, the different papers are, are writing about uh, saving people's lives and, and what have you. So he's up for a, a promotion to lieutenant in 1927. And um, there doesn't seem to be any contention that he's going to get the promotion. But once he's a lieutenant, once he's an officer, he will be in charge of of whites. And given the zeitgeist of the time, this is a little bit too um, too new and too uncomfortable for a lot of society at the time. So the rumor that gets out is that he'll get the promotion, but he'll then be shuttled to a desk job where he won't be seen supervising uh, white firemen. So this is where his dad's talents come into play. He's got influences. He's got skills. He's got friends. So he writes a letter. Uh, his return address, if you can see the letter, is uh, Grand Central uh, Station. And he's writing to Cardinal Hayes. Um, and this was on the advice of uh, uh, Senator Robert Wagner that he says, let Cardinal Hayes know what's going on. I think he'll be interested. I don't know why this was the case, but he does do so. And he explains that Wesley uh, is up for a lieutenancy and he wishes to remain at the Broom Street Station Engine 55, where he's been. Um, symbolically, it's very important, and he's established a relationship there. And, um, you know, can you use your influence, um, you know, to, to, to make it so? We don't have, and uh, thus far, no correspondence has surfaced to, to suggest what uh, Cardinal Hayes has replied, if he replied at all. We do know, though, that the wish was granted. Wesley remained on Broom Street in the position, very visible to all the world as a black supervisor of, of, of everyone. So these were the kinds of things that Williams was able to do. Uh, similarly, with uh, when he organizes an orchestra, uh, he's got all these, these men who, many of them are musical. He knows they've, they've got you know, musical chops to, to, to perform. He um, gets a, a um, really talented conductor to kind of whip them into shape as a band leader who's just come to New York from Washington. Uh, he used to give this guy, what's his name, uh, Duke Ellington work uh, before he came to, to, to New York, uh, Russell Wooding. And he whips the band into shape. And um, Wooding engineers getting the band launched by the NAACP as a musical component going on tour, which helps boost up their membership and what have you. So Williams is behind all of these strings. He's not a, um, a charismatic. I, uh, getting a bead on him, I, uh, he strikes me as somebody who was sort of shy. Um, he spoke when, when he needed to speak and, and, and he, he knew uh, what he wanted and he knew the people who could get things done. Um, and that was a good strategy for him. He knew his own talents as, you know, no one's gonna come and listen to me mouth off about anything, but I know who to call. I know this one's number. I know which train um, Mrs. Roosevelt went, you know, when she calls and wires in from Oyster Bay to say she's going to be coming into the city and asks for me, I know where she's going, I know what she wants, I know who she's going to meet, you know, on, on route, what have you. And he's able to cultivate these relationships and make them work and make introductions that might not ordinarily have taken place. So, so Eric, looking at this letter, um, I don't know where you found the letter, and you can tell us, but you know, the way that you and I met was through our mutual research. And I, have, I am a great admirer 
of how you dig and dig and come up with these amazing little tidbits that really help a story come alive. So where did this letter come from? And, and talk to us a bit about your research process. This letter was one from one of the more conventional uh, resources, which was the, uh, I got it at the Schomburg, the Wesley Williams papers. And uh, that's very conventional. With a subject like Williams, who is, um, he was a celebrity within a limited sort of scope, um, and he wasn't a man of letters, so he didn't have his own papers left anywhere. There were no diaries to read. But he was somebody who, uh, for human interest, would be quoted all the time. Everybody was writing about Grand Central Terminal, you know, th throughout the history of Grand Central Terminal. And so you would want to, you know, do a little story or, or get a quote from uh, somebody like Chief Williams. So I combed a lot of newspapers um, for a lot of the things that I would end up uh, using. Um, eBay, looking for news photos where, uh, where he would show up. Um, uh, also, like this particular photo is him in about 1905, and this is one of my favorites. Uh, this was from one of the family members who had become the re repository of uh, Williams' uh, photo archives, if you will, Charles Ford Williams. And um, this is one of the earliest photos of him. He had just started at Grand Central. He would have been started about two years before. And it's intriguing to me, not just because he's dapper as all get out, um, but it required me doing a little bit more digging through newspaper databases, which I had access to through my Columbia uh, Community Scholars Fellowship, and being able to read a lot of the black press. He was, he was you know, written about in the, white, in the mainstream press as well. But a lot of the black press uh, will give you a lot of information on black figures, not just on themselves, but who they are with. And this is kind of how our work connected because uh, we were able to compare notes. You know, his baby daughter was at, uh, you know, your great grandmother's million dollar wedding as a flower girl. So um, <laughs> this, this particular photo was a favorite of mine because he was, um, he was a member of uh, the Elks, the colored Elks as they were called, and they were controversial. Um, because you may not be able to make it out unless you kind of lean into your screen, but you'll see that he's wearing a lapel pin. And it, the pin is an antler head. And um, the, the Order of the Elks, this fraternity of, of, of the Elks was spreading in black communities across the country really, really, really quickly. And there was a lot of antagonism from white Elks to this happening. So uh, a particular center a senator in New York named William Grattan had introduced a bill to uh, prohibit blacks from wearing insignia of the Elks in, in public. And it was so it was dangerous. I mean, you could you, people were getting beaten up. And indeed, somebody from his lodge, Manhattan Lodge number 45, was arrested. Um, the different lodges had different personalities. The lodge had a lot of uh, influential black businessmen and lawyers. And uh, one of the, um, they took it to court. And after several hearings, um, they examined the evidence and they heard out both sides. And they decided that it, they had the right, since they were excluded from joining the White Elks, that they weren't you know, trying to get over or anything. They had every right to you know, wear an insignia. Um, they weren't representing themselves as any other organization but their own. And so they won the right. And these kinds of battles were um, really predecessors to what would uh, to the generation that they would be the progenitors of of this, the modern day civil rights movement, which is closer to our generation. So uh, on first glance, a photo like this is just like, oh, a handsome guy, you know, you know, everybody gets their photo taken. Um, the studio itself kind of attests to the influence that was part of his sort of supplemental education. He didn't go beyond grade school, uh, which is rather paradoxical considering um, how he felt about being a, an, an usher and a mentor to young college students. Um, but he worked for this uh, florist who I mentioned, Charles Thorley, who was uh, arguably the preeminent florist of the Gilded Age. He's said to have um, uh, created the fashion of, we say, say it with flowers and uh, offering roses, long stem roses, but like in boxes as gifts, uh, ushering in the orchid craze and the violet craze in, in, in the gay 90s. And as a kid, Williams worked for him. And he was a flower messenger, which in the old way, you know, somebody would order flowers and a, a young man, usually a young uh, black kid, who's the messenger, would go to deliver them. 
but you're not just handing over stuff kind of like we are now with our masks on because of the pandemic. You're stepping inside people's homes. You see who they're talking to, who their guests are, what kind of flowers they've, they've ordered. So we was having a whole cultural education in this experience. And by the time he takes this photo, Otto Sarony is the studio. This is the, he's the preeminent uh, photographer of, of celebrities. His studio is right next door to Thorley's down on Broadway and, and uh, 28th Street. So he probably knew the late, the recently late Otto Sarney when he sat for this photo and knew most of Sarney's uh, clients who would have been many of the clients who Thorley would have had. Uh, so all of this, by the time he's an adult, he knows everybody in town. I began the book actually with a quote um, uh, that mentions Williams and it says, there's a young colored man who probably knows more people in New York than any other colored man in the city. And that's James H. Williams of Grand Central uh, Terminal. Uh, and this was why, because he was sort of at the center of things. Um, I should give a footnote too, because he was working for Thorley, who I mentioned, who was also a businessman in his, in his own right. Thorley bought a piece of property, a little triangular piece, piece of Manhattan uh, at 42nd Street, where, it cro where Broadway crosses uh, 7th Avenue. And he sells it in 1902 to this, this newspaper, local newspaper, the New York Times. <laughs> so imagine you're working for this guy, you know, you, you're looking through the ledgers, you see everything about the world, you know, through the ledgers of this florist and, 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 and through the gossip that's going on in these, in these shops. Uh, Thorley was also, um, uh, one of the things that he was noted for was his, most of his shops were, were staffed almost completely by African-Americans. So the shops themselves were not just places where uh, mainstream New York would go to buy flowers, but where African-Americans would know uh, if there was news ab about in the black community, um, not just in New York, but elsewhere, uh, that was, these, these shops were themselves would have been nexuses because people would have known what was going on in the world. So there was another way of getting information and, and disseminating information by knowing who is who. And who knows better than what's going on than a flower messenger, a waiter, a red cap, a porter. You know, your, your ears are open all the time. Your eyes are open all the time to the world that's passing by and you're helping it pass by. And that was Williams's particular uh, edge, I think, that he had in the you know, I think what, you know, what you're telling us is part of the reason your book is really a history of New York and mm -hmm. all different classes and aspects and neighborhoods of New York. One of the reasons that you recently received the Lemon Prize. Um, we are going to go to questions shortly, but I have one more question and then maybe we can do just a really quick um, speed through the beautiful images that you have. But you were drawn to this particular story um, of James H. Williams, but you, I think in the process discovered you actually had a personal connection that you didn't know about. So I yeah. hope you'll share that with us, Daddy yeah. Frank. <laughs> yes. um, you know, every, uh, people often ask, well, how did I stumble upon this? And it was because uh, a few years ago, um, Grand Central Terminal was celebrating its centennial and I was giving tours of the terminal for the Municipal Arts Society. And I wanted to write something not about architecture because everyone would be focusing on the architecture. So I knew that there was a long connection between African Americans and the American Railroad. Um, I didn't realize at the time, I'm not a, a railroad buff, that uh, Grand Central was the most important railroad station in the country. It took me in a flash to learn that. So if you think of, I, I love parks, so if you think of uh, uh, Central Park as being the grandfather of America's great parks, Grand Central Railroad was that to American railroads. Anything that was going on there, other railroad stations were trying to emulate. When they started the red cap system in 1895, it was with a dozen white uh, men. Other stations quickly started this red cap system. When they switched over and decided to integrate it with the hiring of James Williams in 1903, all these stations around the country were starting this. Um, so people it often beg the question, well, did you have red caps in your family? I said, no, not that I know of. Um, well, my flash forward to a few months ago, uh, my mom passed in, in April. And then as one is wont to do, you start digging into um, the things that, you know, you didn't know very, very well. You knew sketchily about a loved one. And um, I remembered her taking 
uh, my brother and I down by train from Penn Station. So I saw the old Penn Station. I have no memory of it. Um, <laughs> when I was, you know, five or six years old. And we get to Jacksonville Station and her, the, one of the men who raised, helped to raise her was Daddy Frank. And so I'm looking through records now as I'm trying to write her obituary. And Daddy Frank had an occupation and he was the head of the Red Caps at, Jan at uh, Jacksonville Terminal. Um, so he was equivalent in Jacksonville to what Williams was in New York. And I had no idea in all of these years. So it, it also attests though to Williams's influence and why these jobs were coveted where there were black communities all over the country. Um, because where jobs were few and far between, it gave you an opportunity to excel. Unlike the Pullman porters, I mean, there were certainly students who were Pullman porters, but red capping, working in the station where you're not riding the rails was much more conducive to, you know, taking courses. You didn't have to negotiate, you know, uh, a, a schedule where, you know, hoping that your train would be on time. So um, the same was true in other towns where there were significant um, uh, dense populations of African Americans like Jacksonville. So that was, there was a connector that I, I wasn't aware of. Um, right. So for the paperback edition, you'll have to um, add something either in the afterword or the foreword about that, about that discovery. So I'm going to look to Dennis, but um, just for a high sign, but I think we're going to take some questions, but maybe you can do like a five minute speed through these beautiful pictures of yours. And then somebody can, if, if sees a, an image that they want to want me to jump back to, I can do that. Great. Uh, I'm still on you there. Let's see. I'll share. Let's yeah, see. I can see the, I can see the image of James Williams, the one where I think he looks a lot like Burt um, Williams. It's interesting, but okay, there we go. Um, Burt Williams, and um, this is the orchestra that he started in 1929. Uh, for those who don't know, Burt Williams was the preeminent uh, actor, pantomimist, uh, the first black actor to be hired by Florence Ziegfeld, and he was the highest paid actor, black or white, um, on Broadway. He was, he's, uh, Ziegfeld hired him in 1910. It was the same season that he hired uh, Fanny Bryce, uh, Funny Girl. And uh, much of uh, Burt Williams's comedy was rooted in stuff, anecdotes um, that he would get on red caps, emulating red caps. So they actually knew each other and there were uh, instances where they were actually uh, at the same uh, black resort in uh, Arbor, New York. Uh, I, I write about this in the book. So this is when he gets the idea to start this orchestra and it grew to be much bigger. Uh, there was uh, even something called the Red Cap Follies, which was staged um, at the, the famous Lafayette Theater in Harlem. And uh, they used actual uh, uh, Red Caps musicians from the orchestra. And by that time they were 40 strong. This is some of the music they recorded. But the singer, I'll, I'll turn it off because it maybe the audio is not delightful, but you can actually get it on YouTube. The singer is um, Luther, um, Frank Luther, uh, whose voice you hear, if, if you know the movie, um, it's Tatum O'Neill, she won the, the award. Madeline Kahn. Uh, da, 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 da. <laughs> Um, anyway, he's singing on the soundtrack. It's a voice that you'll remember. Um, uh, 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 lift your summit, uh, sunny side up, pull your sunny side up. It's one of the old standards. This must be a really young crowd here. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the baseball team that he hires. And you see, they're not just playing for themselves, but they are representing Grand Central Terminal. So your image of Grand Central is in this time in the age of rail is always associated um, with African American workers. So they're part of the iconography, uh, which is another reason I think Williams is, uh, if, you t if you tell the story of Grand Central Terminal, which is a great uh, complex story to tell, inevitably you will talk about Cornelius Vanderbilt, the Commodore, who started it all. And inevitably, you will talk about Jacqueline Onassis, who saved it from demolition. Um, it's just as critical to talk about James Williams, whose crew of upwards, of, as I said, of 500 men um, 
made it all work, made it something worth saving um, and, and, and made it function. And when they were out in the world, they were still very um, out and proud as representatives of Grand Central. If you can see the, the um, logos of Grand Central on their uh, baseball jerseys there. Uh, athletics was a way that uh, Williams not only sort of uh, uh, found a way of, of projecting and broadcasting the, the name of Grand Central and the talents of his men, but also of encouraging students in staying in school. The oldest um, black athletic association is the ATA, the American Tennis Association, which was founded in uh, 1916. That is still operating. And for about 30 years, as a re, uh, sort of an encouragement to keep um, young black students interested not only in academics, but in the sort of wholesome activity of tennis, uh, they wanted to create a special award. So they approached uh, Chief Williams at Grand Central because, because they knew he had a reputation with working with young people and inspiring them. And um, they bought an $800 Tiffany Silver Loving Cup uh, which was the highest prize. It went into competition in 1931. Uh, this is the winner from um, Tuskegee. I think this was 1935. And it remained in competition for about three decades until it became somewhat obsolete as black uh, uh, tennis players were being invited to play um, in mixed events like Althea Gibson and uh, Arthur Ashe, you know, circa uh, you know, 19, uh, 1960. And so um, I was very fortunate to be able to find a picture of the cup. We don't know where the actual cup is anymore, but um, my detectives are out working on that. <laughs> so Eric, let's do two more um, slides and then we'll see if Dennis sees any questions. Sure, so this is uh, his oldest daughter. So his first child was Wesley, 1897 he was born. Gertrude Williams was born the next day. You could see she's a radiant beauty. She was particularly famous for winning beauty prizes and as a flapper for her bobbed hair. And she became one of Harlem's best known uh, manicurists. Um, and she was uh, uh, now in one of those photos, she's standing on the step, steps of uh, Strivers Row. This was an, an, an enclave in Harlem, which is still uh, an exclusive enclave. And they were, uh, the Williamses were uh, one of the first black families that moved on to Strivers Row when it finally opened up to, to black families in uh, about 19, uh, 1920. And uh, this is uh, <laughs> a little, perfect ending, right? <laughs> family. Um, uh, the million dollar wedding that um, Alelia's namesake, Alelia Walker, uh, uh, threw for her daughter. Ostensibly, there were 9,000 invited guests. I would hate to be the, the secretary in charge of having to write out all those invitations. But the three flower girls you see, the one on the extreme left, is Chief Williams' uh, 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 youngest child, um, uh, Kay, um, Catherine, and she was uh, one of the, 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 the three fl flower girls. And that was one of the headlines I mentioned. Uh, here's a good- Oh yeah, this is a good one to, to end on. This is great. Sense of some of the notables uh, who were acquainted uh, personally with James uh, Williams, uh, many of whom you recognize. Uh, one at the bottom, I like to point out because somebody ought to write a biography about her, right next to Governor Lehman, <laughs> who is also in the book, um, is Bessie, it's a drawing of uh, Bessie Bearden. She the, was the mother of the artist Romare Bearden. And uh, you look up, you'll see uh, Bilbo Jangles Robinson, uh, Alberta Hunter, uh, the singer, there's uh, uh, Alelia Walker, Charles F. Thorley next to, to Walker. Uh, there's Cardinal Hayes, who I mentioned. Governor Al Smith, all the way at the top. Um, they were so, said to have been very, very good friends. There's, I have a photo there of Williams with a bowler hat that supposedly was given to him by um, the former governor, Al Smith. And he would always wire Williams that he was coming in from, uh, uh, from, from Albany. Williams was the only one who was really allowed to meet the celebrities. So a lot of his role became somewhat symbolic uh, for that purpose, which was why he became sort of easier than uh, a lot of the others to, to, to research um, because he was the one you'd want to, to quote. And there was Joe Lewis in that top row as well, who became a friend of the family. Um, he's meeting Joe Lewis as he arrives on, in, in New York um, on the 20th Century Limited. So, oh, 
Eric, well, I don't know. I, maybe you need to talk about this one before we go to questions. <laughs> Red caps, men who actually carry bags, um, some of whom I mentioned. Uh, I have a, a few favorites. There's a fellow in this, in this well, you see Paul Robeson at the top there, um, right below Paul Robeson. Uh, George Gabriel was a linguist, and he spoke 18 languages. And he came to New York from uh, Ethiopia. It was, it was said that he was the only Abyssinian in America at the time. I don't know if this is true, but he arrives here in January of 1913 on the behest of Teddy Roosevelt. He had been Roosevelt's um, interpreter um, on his Roosevelt's uh, African safari in, in, in uh, 1909. And he'd been all over the world except for North America. And Roosevelt said, if you ever come here, look me up. He came here, went to Oyster Bay. Um, Roosevelt tried to get him a job as an interpreter in Washington. He was not able to get it because he wasn't a, a naturalized citizen. So Grand Central was about to open up and Roosevelt, uh, it's, it's, it's assumed that it must have been Roosevelt that made the introductions to get him there. And he was often written about as Grand Central's official interpreter. And this doesn't seem to have been correct because the only job that you could have had at Grand Central if you were African American was as a red cap. But they did have a, an official interpreter who was about five languages short of George Gabriel. So at a couple of instances where he fell short, red cap number 20, who is George Gabriel, was called. Um, but he was only being, he was used as an interpreter, but he was only being paid a red cap salary. Mm -hmm. He ended up moving up to Buffalo and becoming uh, the head of the red caps in, in, in Buffalo. And then Earl Brown, I'll, I'll just end with him, two, two photos away, uh, right in the center there. He was a Harvard graduate, a star baseball player. Um, he was a writer, one of the first editors of Life, black editors of Life magazine, wrote a lot about the war during the Second World War. And uh, he was even Manhattan Borough president for two months as an uh, on the interim. And it was he who had the idea for uh, the present Frederick Douglass Circle at um, Central Park West in 110th Street in, in Manhattan uh, to be named that. Um, so it was decades before, it was dedicated in 1970, so decades before they actually mounted a statue of Frederick Douglass. Uh, and I, I often give him the last word because he said if it hadn't been for people like Chief Williams, uh, who was proud of his race, uh, a lot of people like himself, students would never have been able to finish school. So, and this is why we all need to have copies of, of Eric's book uh, so that we can learn even more. Now, Dennis is going to be watching out if people would um, hit the little on the reaction button at the bottom, you can raise your hand to ask a question. And while we're waiting for people- hey, We have two questions already. Oh, oh you do? Okay, great, yep. great, great. Uh, first is from Michelle Tortorelli. She would like to know if Williams was part of a Harlem social scene. Yes, um, on, on different levels. So a lot of social scenes were uh, organized around different uh, crisis points, which is say like World War I. He was a big organizer and was cited often in the papers for going over the top and raising money to buy uh, Liberty Bonds during the, 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 the First World War, um, sending over supplies to, um, if you've heard of the Harlem Hellfighters, these were uh, the black troops went over and distinguished themselves. The first two decorated American heroes of the war were African Americans. One was a red cap in Albany, uh, Roberts and Henry Johnson. And um, he would send them, um, people, a lot of the black troops, um, sweaters and gloves and scarves and copies of the black press um, and candy, which they would seem to, they, some of them wrote back, they were really grateful for the candy. And uh, he chaperoned Needham Roberts uh, when he came back to New York and there was a big demonstration, not demonstration, but uh, at, at Carnegie Hall with uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt and the, and the journalist Erwin Cobb. And um, Williams was the perfect person to be the chaperone because of his relationship with these men. So in, in terms of social circles that had to do with sort of causes, he was there. But also um, in terms of fraternal, as I mentioned, fraternal organizations, they would often be hosts of a lot of uh, social organizations. Williams himself, <laughs> would uh, organize these uh, dances. Uh, sometimes they were indoors, like at the Renaissance Ballroom, Renaissance Casino, or they were uh, moonlight sails up the Hudson. And they were usually free, and they were very popular. There was music by the Red Cap Orchestras, 
And uh, they were kind of the way of, of doing thank yous uh, to the community just for, for um, it was like, like a give back. And they were billed as Jimmy and his gang, Jimmy being uh, James Williams and the gang being the Red Caps. Um, and these were hugely uh, popular and, and much anticipated. Very often they were pre-Lenten affairs. We don't have those so much anymore, but um, just before Lent starts, there were these big fairs, kind of, kind of like uh, Mardi Gras when, you, when the partying is going to stop. So these were, were affairs that were organized then. But then there were many of them were often um, in the summer. There was actually an instance where uh, Elili Walker, uh, Elili Bundle's um, great-grandmother, uh, was, was having a tea uh, on the same day as Williams was having a, a, a boat trip. And everybody left promptly from the, from the tea of a Lily Walker's house. And some, many of the same people were, were showing up on the boat um, like Alberta Hunter. So it's like they weren't going to miss an event. And indeed, Lily Walker, I think, was w one of the ones who, who was there. <laughs> Never to miss a party. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, Denise Shaw says, Alilia, you referred to the parallel world that the Red Caps inhabited. As historians, can you, as the great granddaughter of Madam C.J. Walker and Eric, comment on the width and breadth and significance of the affiliations, associations, and societies that supported the social, educational, athletic, religious, and employment needs of the Blacks at the time? So there's a dissertation. Yeah. But <laughs> so thank you, Denise. But Eric, I mean, that's really what Eric's book is about. So Eric, you need to take that away. Yeah, so there were, um, this is one of the things that I think you'll become aware of as you're reading the book. There were, because there was segregation, racial segregation in New York, as, and, and New York was, was in that way in, not dissimilar from the rest of the country, there were all these parallel worlds. There was a middle, uh, these jobs were an, en an entree uh, into the middle class in a way that a lot of blacks had of sustained the middle class. And with the middle class, you had a lot of organizations, I mentioned athletic organizations. I mean, what's more genteel than, than tennis, um, but also, you know, basketball teams and, and uh, things that were, that were organized around athletics, things that were organized around um, legal issues, uh, civil rights issues, um, before we were, you know, um, we identify like the civil rights movement sort of selectively with the 50s and 60s and, and Martin Luther King, but civil rights issues uh, that were germane at the time. Um, so uh, there were parallel worlds that were, that were kind of, uh, many things that you were finding in mainstream white society, these same sorts of organizations were existing in black society, uh, notably in, 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 in Harlem, as Harlem was becoming the capital of black America. Um, around music, you had music schools, uh, the music school settlement uh, for colored, colored people, as it was called, um, which was founded by um, David Manis and his wife, uh, uh, Clara Damrosh uh, Manis, and J. Rosamond Johnson, uh, was the director of that. Um, this is where a lot of young blacks were able to go to school or if they were uh, musicians already to, to teach. Uh, James Vanderzees, many of you are familiar with him as a, as a probably the preeminent Harlem photographer. Um, he was also a musician. Everybody seemed to, you know, dabble in music and photography at some point. And um, uh, he, was a, he was associated with the school. Um, the uh, composer H. Lawrence Freeman was associated with the school. Uh, a Harlem Symphony was founded um, and was had associations with, with the school and other venues in Harlem, like the Lafayette Theater and the Renaissance Casino. Um, prison reform issues, um, they were, these were parts, uh, these were organizations were formed around them. So you had this whole infrastructure of um, cultural societies, political societies, um, fraternal orders, um, and then you had, you know, mixes, you, you know, you always had separate societies that were women's clubs, uh, Las Estrellas uh, was a women's group, um, uh, and there were several of those that were often responsible for uh, fundraising for a lot of the things that the men got credit for because they were at the board meetings and their pictures were in the paper, but it was often the, the, the women's groups, the auxiliary groups that were actually doing the, a lot of the, the genteel grunt work of getting the money raised so that this uh, benefit could go on, or that the invitations go out so that influential people like Carl Van Vechten, uh, the writer and photographer, and the downtown bohemian group would 
you know, come to Harlem and report on these things and, 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 and um, see how the other half lives. So um, I think the 20s in particular, this, this period that we refer to um, romantically as the Harlem Renaissance was kind of the penultimate of that, where races were all of a sudden discovering each other and interacting um, with great, you know, fervor. Um, and much of that gets kind of derailed, if I may use a railroad term, um, by the by the Great Depression, which you know, you know, kind of changes the pattern of these of these societies. I, I hope that answers uh, the question that you were asking about parallel societies. Um, all right, we have a few more questions. Let's try to rush through these. Uh, Sheila Rogers is asking, were the Red Caps unionized? Great question. So. Um, unlike their brethren, the Pullman Porters, who were famously organized by A. Philip Randolph in 1925, um, when, when William starts in 1903, and then when he becomes uh, the chief in 1909, six years later, the organization, which, when it's reported in the papers, is more about, uh, or I should say less about collective bargaining uh, issues that the Pullman Porters are are focusing on in, in 1925, but rather on getting the job, on sort of owning this department. A year after Williams enters, integrates the workforce um, in 1903 when he's hired, a year later, it's entirely black. So this all of a sudden creates a dynamic where they realize we've got a certain uh, kind of camaraderie, we've got um, issues that we, um, can focus on and exchange with because we are now a, a community. We are essentially it's Harlem with an annex at, at, at Grand Central. So they do form a union, uh, but it's after the Pullman Porters and they use a lot of that that model of the, that the Pullman Porters used in, in, in the 1920s when the Red Caps start to form a union in the late 1930s, circa uh, uh, 1940. But one of the things that didn't make it into the book because I think a lot of authors continue to write the book that's been published already, because if you're fascinated by the subject, there's still things that you know you didn't have access to. Um, the Pullman Porters made attempts to organize before A. Philip Randolph in the 20s. And in the 19 aughts uh, was a significant move where they were trying to form a, uh, a union and it was in some of the papers. And at that time, they were ambitious enough to include uh, not only uh, rail porters, but station porters. And William's name comes up. And I think I missed the name because I tried all different permutations of his spelling, James H. Williams, J. H. Williams, um, J. A. S. Williams, blah, blah, blah. And one that got by me was James Henry Williams. He never spelled his name this way. And don't you know that I recently found something and he was spelling it all the way out. Maybe he was testing on how to spell his name as he was coming into prominence. But he was one of those people who was uh, connected conspicuously with this attempted organization uh, uh, of a union by the Pullman Porters uh, when it was going to include Red Caps as well. In uh, It was around 1905, 1906. Um, so yes, they did form a union and that became UTSI, uh, 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 they changed their name in 1940 from the International Red Cra Brotherhood of Red Caps to uh, the United Transit, one of those god-awful long names, I can remember why they shortened it to Utsi. <laughs> okay, we have uh, about one minute, but let's try to squeeze in two questions. Okay. Uh, how many Red Caps are still alive, and were you able to interview many of them for the book? Most were dead, and the red capping uh, pretty much died out. Uh, they still exist. It's a different bag now because you're not, these are not jobs that you are relegated to by, by race anymore. So the Penn, uh, Penn Station lines, they still have red caps. Uh, it, it's very, very different. And even if you go in the station, they wear baseball caps. They don't look, have that sort of militarized kind of look. So the look of authority isn't there anymore. You kind of have to pick them out. But the, the issues are very, very different. And a lot of that um, attrition has to do with the age of rail just started to disappear. Uh, William's death in 1948 was rather timely in the sense that uh, it's not long after that that super highways are going to be built. Uh, people are going to be flying much more often uh, and driving of their own volition. So, um, uh, you know, they, it kind of died out. So they're not as essential. And people 
also know that you know to travel best you travel light so you carry more you carry less hmm. uh, so the need for a red cap um, is not the same and uh, last question by Michelle Tortorelli. Have you signed a movie contract yet? And if so, when will it come out? <laughs> uh, not yet. Uh, I'm, I'm leaning on for Micah, which is passing for wood, right? Now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we, we are at the end of our hour. Um, on behalf of the library, our host, Sarah Davison, I'd like to thank the two of you for a really, really informative talk. We're thrilled to have had you as part of Walker's Night. Totally my Thank pleasure. You Thank you. Enjoy the book. <laughs> yes, buy the book. <laughs> Thank you very much.